Because it's low degree. It's it's raining. Raining. And all roads lead to dissertation. All roads lead to dissertation. Well, it is it is sort of the culmination of of this degree and what you have to do to get out. Oh. Um, but it's also it's, it's also such a cool opportunity to even though it's it's both arduous and time consuming it's such a cool opportunity to dig into something deeply and even as you're angsting over it at the end of it it's such an extraordinary feeling to have produced it and what I uh, would like to say is that Many of you are at different stages in your careers here as, as students and fielding. And I think it is so important to link your courses to that eventual outcome, which is the dissertation. If you can. Right? What I mean is the skills oh, right. that you will be learning will translate over to when you get to this end. And so by that we mean your academic writing, your claims to evidence, your having sources, knowing how to write a lit review. So um, research methods, all of those things, if you think of your courses as sort of parts in what becomes that dissertation whole, just cognitively, I think it will help you out. Right, because our goal is, not my thing's not turned on, my go our goal, is this yes Yay. not this <laughs> so we're going to go through essentially as it said the nuts and bolts of decisions some of this isn't very interesting um but it's all fairly important interrupt at any time with any questions the questions don't necessarily have to be exactly related to the process but your concerns about the process questions about the process and then at the end if we want to if we have time and we want to go back to developing questions we can do that we did that this morning for a while um, but we can certainly come back and revisit that grab a chair so the dissertation really can start with the qualifying exam or the QE in the sense that that's where for um, and I think, do we have, we have somebody from media, or I mean from clinical here? Um, we no, know, we're all media. media. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I wasn't right. misspeaking the process if there, if or somebody's from coming. Yeah. 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 Um, that our qualifying exam is really the beginning of the funnel where you can start narrowing your research topic. Um, it's like the dissertation, it's an iterative process, which means you write a draft, your chair reads it, your chair sends it back to you and tells you all the things you did wrong and are missing and have to do for them to approve it. You edit it, you send it back to your chair, they read it again, and I'll make the slideshow available. And, and then it goes to your reader, who may also have some pearls of wisdom for you, all that has to happen in a term if you want to get your QE done in a term. Okay, so, and I also want to emphasize one aspect. By the time you get to your QE and dissertation, your work in the program changes. Up until that point, you have been taking courses, and we know that you know, you're given readings, you know, we provide the readings, you might have to go out and find the readings. This is very much work that is very independent, but done in conjunction with your committee and your chair. So I say that because some students sort of do feel that change because where they might excel at the core structure, but then have issues in terms of getting used to that kind of working alone. And, and I have, there have been some students that have told me that it's a difficult well, transition. Yeah, yeah, it's a very different transition with mm -hmm. you've been given a reading list and prompt yeah. questions, and now you're providing the prompt question and you're developing the reading list and we're establishing standards and we're saying, well, you didn't really cover all this literature, right? So what, so it's a push me, pull you um, in terms of what happens. But if you can start and start that funnel at the QE, you'll save yourself a lot of aggravation later on. Now, that being said, if you start something on the QE that you think you're going to do your dissertation on 
and you hate it after a term, it's okay to change topics at that point. It takes you a little bit longer. You don't have to redo your QE. You did a QE, but it means that, you're, that your pre-proposal is going to take you a little bit longer because you're going to have a little bit of more research to do to get to that level. Oh, that's right. I didn't plug this in. Yeah. Talk and, and, and what I want to also say is that when you get to dissertation, you're dealing with, really with sort of two levels of functioning. On the one hand, it is really important to understand that this is a process and it's an administrative process. There are, you have to familiarize yourself with the rules, what has to be done. Now, your chair will help you out with that, but you can save a lot of time if you are familiar with the process, what the steps are, what are the major keystones, because you know, um, we can spend a lot of time back and forth with a student explaining, well, at this point you have to file this sheet and this is part of what goes in there and it generates an enormous amount of work that is really unnecessary if you have a sense of what the process is. This is administrative. We do have to file the steps with fielding. You just can't do it with me, right? We have to go that that step, and if it's not recorded, you're not going you to get credit. You don't exist, right? You not you don't, will not get credit. They keep track of this, so that's one layer to the dissertation, and then the other thing is the content of your idea and working those out. And and Regina's right that you really have to take ownership over the process, yes, because there are times when faculty. Not me, not her. Forgets, <laughs> forgets to submit something. So it looks like on paper that you finished your QE when really you, your pre-proposal is approved, as far as you believe, but the administration doesn't know that. right? So it's really important periodically to check in, just like you do with, uh, with Tim with the, you know, the grade audit or the class audit, to just check in and make sure that everything that you think you've turned in is in fact turned in right or even sometimes i will ask the student uh well you know we we have this process where it's a, a sheet that we have to keep track of and i usually the student always has a copy and i have a copy of the most updated one and i will say to the student when we finish a milestone i'll say okay go ahead and fill out this date and whatever send it to me and i will send it but if we have a student that is even though we filled out the sheet they still don't know what the sheet is it's, right. It just generates, it's like, it just, it's not good. Not good for my health. Um, <laughs> not good for your health. Not good for the flow. Think of the flow. That's right. It's still not working. Okay. Is this, well, so this is the dissertation process that Dan Sewell um, created. Bless his soul. I know, bless his heart. I made one in Excel. Um, <laughs> The point of all of these boxes here, because I don't expect you to read them, and I will make this slideshow available so that you can download the PowerPoint so you don't have, don't be back there drawing little boxes because yeah. that would be awful. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, come on in. Um, is to, to realize that this is really a long process and some of these things you have no control over, right? Send your proposal to your chair on January 1st, February 1st. You receive feedback from your chair. And that's a really important thing to remember is that the faculty has 30 days to read and respond to these big documents. Now, as I said this morning, that seems like an extraordinarily long amount of time and we're not out on, you know, the south of France, you know, drinking margaritas. No, you would, that's kind of a mixed metaphor. But anyway, <laughs> um, instead of reading your work, right? There are times when even 30 days is a scramble for us, given when the things come in. It's the end of term. We're grading final papers. You know, right now I've got four on my desk but, waiting to be read. But there are also, which is not reflected here, the exceptions to the rule, because there are sort of in between the term breaks. Yeah, term breaks. Winter session. Winter session. In that 30 days. It doesn't count. So if you're going to turn something in and you turned it in before winter session, and let's say you turned it in January 1st, it's going to be hard for me to do February 1st unless you're the only one right. that's on my docket at this point. Right. So you have to keep those exceptions that are built into the system because when we're here, technically, the clock stops for that kind of work. Right. So what we recommend is, 
identifying when you want to graduate, when you want to start gathering data, some of those pivotal points, and count backwards. And don't be thinking, oh, I can write my thing in you know three weeks, no problem. Right? Be realistic. If you're faster, awesome. But don't be. Uh, but be realistic in because this is a long journey. It is not just a sprint. This is a long distance run. Preserve, you know, you want to preserve your energy and your moral fortitude. Um, not to mention your ever, never ending good cheer. Uh -huh. um, so what we'll do today is we'll talk about what's the point of a dissertation? What's the process? What are the parts? How long does it take and why does it take so friggin' long? <laughs> How do I plan? How do I form a committee? Or do you find an external? What is the IRB and why and when do I need it? And, and along the way, Pam and I will provide little tidbits of, you know, kernels of, of knowledge, of wisdom, <laughs> of how to work with a committee. What does it mean when you work with a committee? You know, all of that kind of stuff. So hopefully it'll help. Right. So this just the whole purpose of the dissertation is to show your mastery. Right. You are becoming a subject matter expert. Yes. Right. You're investing in this. Now, I want to make it pretty clear, though, just because you are becoming a subject matter expert does not mean this has to define you for the rest of your life. No matter what you do your dissertation about, you will learn things that you will use fairly quickly, no matter what it is that you do. So don't angst over trying to find something that exactly fits your career or exactly fits where you want to go. I mean, if you, if you have a very clear path, awesome, you know, go there. But don't feel constrained by that because we don't want you wasting time looking for the perfect question so that you can build the perfect career when we could just get you graduated and let you move on. And, and essentially, you know, what you learn in a dissertation um, you do become a subject area expert, but what you're really showing is that you have the skills to become a subject area expert in anything that you choose. Because just because you're a PhD and you did your dissertation here, well, now I'm interested in this. And right. you can gravitate there as well. Yeah. So, and you've developed yeah. skills, and I'll tell you one thing, that no one um, has ever asked me what I did my dissertation in. Nope. Ever. Yep. They'd never asked me what grades I got in graduate school. Of course, no one talks to me, but no. I <laughs> and, and with me, for all they know, that she never even went to grad school. <laughs> well, what happened? Oh, well, we'll just use that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the process. So, like, the really boring stuff, what you do, and then what happens. The committee. Committee has four members. The, there are three internal members and one external member. So when you hear people talking about EEs, that's an external examiner. Fielding has you know acronyms out the wazoo, so never hesitate to stop somebody and ask which one they're talking about. Your chair is your choice. Your uh, academic advisor will be your chair if you want them to be. You are free to choose anyone at any you know any time up, up to change faculty advisors or to choose any chair that you want when you get to the dissertation process or the QE process. It's more efficient to have the same chair for your QE as you do for your dissertation just because they're now familiar with the way you're thinking and how you're building a question. It's not necessary but it's, it's more efficient. Yeah, I mean, Pam makes a good point, and sometimes students are confused. Does my faculty advisor have to be my chair? Absolutely not, and a lot of students think that that's actually the case. That's not the case. You know, your faculty advisor is there to advise you, and at that point where you do pick a, cha a chair, it is recommended, or, or do, do they automatically become your advisor? They are, at the point where, when you pick a dissertation chair, that person automatically right. also becomes your faculty advisor. Because at that point, they're going to be responsible for those milestones and the, the whole administrative process attached to it. So it would make no sense to have somebody else as your academic advisor. Right. Uh, the external causes people a lot of anxiety. The external is someone who holds a PhD in psychology. 
If you are doing a very specialized topic and you have someone who is in a related a related field who's also a PhD, you can get it waived, but it is on, you know, it's one by one decision by uh, the program director. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, useful to have somebody who's a PhD in psychology since this is a degree in psychology. Uh, it, the person has to be relevant to and helpful to your topic. It can't just be some per nice person that you know who has a PhD in psychology. And it can't be a personal friend or there can't be other conflicts of interest. Um, so be careful about that. And then a really important thing, fielding has three terms, right? We're 24-7 we're university on all the time. Other places go away for the summer. <laughs> So check with whoever is going to be your external and make sure they're in fact going to be available to read your dissertation in a timely way. They read it twice, they read the proposal, they have to sign off, and they read the full dissertation. And for that, they get the princely sum of $300. No, I think it's more. I don't think so. Oh, because I had, yeah. I think, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's 300 per read. Is it? Yeah. Well, I got an email from Gary Lynn about that. Wow. Um, also, it's so important to know they are external to fielding. When I get a student who says, I've got to graduate and, you know, you send me a draft and we've been working on it. And but you send it at a time where we're all going away for Christmas. I, if it's an emergency, though, it won't be. I mean, I could, if there's an issue, I could see my turning to Pam and saying, Pam, you know what, we really need to get this through. We have no such leverage over externals. They're not internal to fielding, right? They go away on vacation. Right. They go away on, and I absolutely have no leverage right. over that. So please bear that in mind. They have to sign, you, they, if they don't sign off, and they could come back and, and say, here's an issue. right? I have no say. I mean, well, as a chair, you can sort of manage, but they have to sign out. You have to sign This up. is working by committee. This is not just a person passing you in a class. Right. This is where we have to come to consensus. Very different. Yeah, and another and thing that. Do you have to be present in any particular moments within a group? Uh, or is no, they don't have to attend committee out. meetings or anything okay. like that. They just have to read and provide feedback mm -hmm. and then fill out a form that goes back to the administration. Um, usually they do attend the final oral review. Some of them uh, do. Uh, at least in my cases, but but uh, uh, if they can't, they will let us know and right. and then do the work beforehand. Well, they can attend virtually, right? Yes, yeah, virtually. Yeah, no, they don't yeah. come in person. Matter of fact, most final no. oral reviews are virtual yeah. all the way around. That is a difference between our program and clinical. Or did they change that? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the other thing to think about is that this the dissertation obviously becomes public, but the external examiner is someone who's scrutinizing your work. They're at another institution. So not just your reputation is on the line, but the institution. And if I'm your chair, I'm signing this document. Yes. My academic integrity. Absolutely is also resting on the quality of your work. So there are times where you can say, why can't you send it to committee? It's like, cause it's not good enough. Now I won't say it like that. Um, <laughs> she says it with a smile. <laughs> you can see it in the email. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's really important. And it's, you know, and I said this this morning and I'm gonna say it again because this is really important to me. I want you to have a solid piece of work. Yes. I want you, when you're yes. standing at a podium someplace, delivering yes. your work, I want you bulletproof. I don't want some, you know, student of somebody that you misquoted on page seven standing up and saying, well, that's not what so-and-so said, or how can you define something like that when the rest of the literature says this, or how can you say that causes that when this is a correlational study? I want you bulletproof so that you have this foundation. However you choose to build your career, a PhD is a big part of that career. Whether or not it's related, the topic is related or not, the moment you have a PhD, everyone thinks you're a hundred times smarter. It's remarkable. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, 
but it's really a foundation. And so I want that foundation to really be bedrock. And Regina feels the same way. We have yeah. a lot of discussions about this. Oh, yeah. yeah. So when we're being obnoxious, keep in mind that that's why, is that we want this a really good piece of work. I think we've made this clear that this is iterative. You send it to us, we send it back to you. You send it to us, we send it back to you. And then once it's in a pretty clean place, it goes to committee. As a chair, I don't ever send a draft to committee until I think it's close. Because I want you to get the absolute best feedback from your committee members possible. I don't want them having to grapple through something that still needs major reorganization, that's missing large pieces of the literature. I want them to really work with you on their subject matter expertise, not your structure or your writing, you know, or the gaps. Um, so obviously the question is important, hard to have a dissertation without one. Uh, we, we can talk about this in depth later, but one of the things that we look for is that there's a so what, right? That there's, and that there's theory behind your question. And probably the most important part in the process, I can't tell you how many times people come to me and say, I'm going to do a qualitative study. I just don't know on what yet, right? You do not decide on the methodology until you have the question. And I don't mean the research question at the QE stage. I mean the actual god darn question that you're going to use, that you're going to research. Because that dictates, just the words that you use in your question dictate the methodology. So I, I have an example of that. And, um, you know, I mean, I think you can intuitively, once you go through your methods courses, you could possibly say, I'm a little more, I think I'm more on the qualitative side. I mean, you know, that, that just speaks to me more than quantitative. Or you're the kind of person, I think when I, when I get to point for the, this, I'll probably do quantitative because that's really my style, you know. So you could have that, right? But you need to be careful that... You know, and this has happened where a student falls in love with a specific methodology without having a question. Right. And basically, you are going to engineer a question to that methodology. And it's not organic. It's really engineering something. And oftentimes, it doesn't work. And you will hear us say, don't talk to me about methodology. Talk to me about right. a question. I can't talk to you about methodology. And, and you'll be surprised once you get a question, you may think, oh, I can't do quant and I'm only a qualitative person. And you get this question and it's so clearly how to do it in a quantitative study. And it turns out, golly, gee, it's not all that really that hard, you know. And and in fact, quantitative is actually easier than qualitative in terms of the, you know, seat of the pants to the seat of the chair. So it don't be afraid of one or the other. You know, take the methods class, put your anxieties aside, and then work on the question. And then if there's you're anxious about something, then we'll handle it. And I, I just want to say that when it comes to methods, um, um, you know, as a chair, I really hold you accountable uh, to your becoming an expert in your methodology. I mean, I think that that's part of it, that if you do a dissertation, not only is it domain, uh, and content, uh, but you are an expert in factor analysis. You know, you can explain it to somebody else, you know what it is, you've worked in it. And so I think that's important to know because that's also expected of what you get from a dissertation. And I certainly um, expect students who work with me uh, watch my, my workflow decrease immediately. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. <laughs> Which is a great thing. Right. You can hire tutors to help you understand factor analysis. You can actually hire people to do the math. But if you're going to use factor analysis, so you have to it. know what it is and why you're using yes. it. Right? Because we don't want you just hiring a stats guy to run your numbers. And then you say, well, I got this. And you say, why? And they say, well, I don't know. That's we, This is what he got. <laughs> uh, so... So understand the difference between, you know, we're not going to lock you in a room with a pencil and a pad of paper and make you calculate your statistics. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, once had a student who went to a conference, presented research. 
one of the questions that came out is why did you choose this methodology over that? I remember the student kind of looking at me at that point and we realized that there are people out there when you go in public and you're presenting your research and they obviously think that perhaps a narrative analysis is the way you should have gone as opposed to just a content analysis. Right. And that's a legitimate question. Right, and so the answer to that is that such a stupid question, I'm gonna have my advisor answer it. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Here's my shadow. <laughs> so, QE gets you to where you can start on the dissertation. The start of the dissertation is the pre-proposal. Yes. The pre-proposal is a sketch of what you're going to do. It is not your complete methodology. It is not your complete literature review. It is showing us that you have a clear vision of where you're going. You do not have to have your exact research question for the pre-proposal. You have to be close but you still have opportunities to work with your methodologist and work with your chair to hone that question and to hone your methodology. But you should have a general idea of how you're going to approach it. And you should have logic behind, as we were saying, the, the choices that you're making. A pre-proposal will mention the areas of literature you're going to cover, much like the QE, only now you've got it honed down so it's very clearly supporting your argument but it's not everything you're going to cover in your full proposal. It should not be terribly long. No. It really should not. <laughs> it really, I, uh, my experience, uh, when it's really a good one, 15 pages is really yeah, very good. Right. I find that a lot of times, uh, the longer it goes, it's because it's still not ready. You know? Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it depends on, the complexity of your question, how many fields your question is drawing in, sort of how many areas that you're covering. But basically, you're trying to give, think of it as a marketing document, right? Because the pre-proposal is what you will probably send to your EE to try and convince them to be on your committee. I mean, you'll also give them a synopsis in an email in case they don't really want to read something 15 to 30 pages long. But the pre-proposal is only, only gets signed off internally. It's actually where a strong chair model at fielding, which means that the chair decision can't override other members of the committee, but only if the other members of the committee agree to be overridden. I mean, they well, can actually make I, trouble. I, my you know? experience is that the, the other members give feedback. Right. And the really the one who has to sign off is the chair, but the others do give feedback. They, and I mean, and we're they collegial. Have, right. So Pam gives me feedback. I'm definitely going to, I'm going to take it into account. Now, if Pam comes in and says, you know, something that you guys said, Pam, what are you doing? You read the wrong paper. <laughs> you know, I was like, what are you doing? I mean, it's that kind of thing. But here's what we're really looking uh this is what we're really looking for. Um, do you know what you're doing and can you present it conceptually? It's not finished, but it's pretty, I mean, we're gonna finesse it now when we get to the other stage. And are you ready to move forward? Yeah, into the full proposal. And think of the full proposal as being a recipe card. Mix the recipe card for what you are gonna do in your dissertation. Right, so you write the proposal and then don't come and tell me you, you did something else. The proposal, think of it as a contract between yep. you and your chair of what you are going to do, right? Because the methodologist works with you to design the methodology that is what you are going to do. The IRB application, the inter, inter, in, but, 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 internal but, review but, board to make sure that it's ethical research. Um, that has to be exactly what's on the IRB application or you have to resubmit it. So the proposal is very specific. The pre-proposal is where you're trying to get specific in a short amount of space where we can flag any problems and help sort of guide the process. And, you know, it's really important because we find that um, if a student has issues at this earlier stage, if we don't continue to work with them at this early stage, guess what? Those issues 
will translate over and it will slow you down. So I mean, if you think of the process, it probably is a lot slower initially, but once you hone in proposal, it's approved, now you have the model. And all you're really doing, it, it tells you what to do. Yeah, and then you're execute. going and then you apply it. And then, then we have the issues of writing, but it's never like having to create from scratch because you already have something to work with. Right. Yeah. That's why we spend so much emphasis on the question. And the, the pre-proposal is to get you in a place where literally you know what you're doing. Yeah. It's just one foot in front of the other, where there aren't all of these angsting questions and and the people that you see struggling with their dissertations are ones where their question is still wobbling all around. Yes. And they're they're in their proposal stage and they're thinking, well, I know I want to do this. And, you know, and it's moving over here and it's moving over there. You know, if you can nail all that down and do all that angsting early on. Yes. Um, and then I said this this morning, I'll say it again. Solve world peace after you get your Ph.D., <laughs> The point of the dissertation is to graduate, right? There's, you can, and when you're doing your dissertation, especially if it's a topic that you're really excited about, you'll think of 500 other questions you want to ask, write them down in a notebook. Do not put them in your survey, right? Save those for later. When you don't have to, when you can do your own research, you don't have to deal with a chair. You don't have to deal with an IRB. You're on your own. You can, you have a lot of latitude to do what you want to do. Um, you know, I mean, unless you're publishing in certain publications, in which case you have to have a certain amount of um, academic rigor. But the point of this is to do a nice study, not solve all of the problems that you want to solve all at once. The full proposal is the first three chapters of your dissertation. It's the full introduction, which is really setting the stage. Yes. It's giving the context and the problem that you are trying to solve, not solve, that you are trying to contribute to the betterment of with your dissertation. You know, it's whatever the problem is in social media, whatever the problem is in, you know, whatever, whatever. Right. I mean, my dissertation, which of course you don't know because no one has ever asked me, looked at <laughs> looked at the predisposition towards conflict with China of Americans before and after the Beijing Olympics. Okay. So my introduction was really describing the attitudes towards China, the things that had happened in China that had changed the attitudes of Americans, the shift of the press away from Russia as the enemy to China as the enemy. You know, so it was describing the political landscape to set the stage for why I wanted to know whether or not something like the Olympics could change people's minds about China. Because China's big, the US is big, war is bad, seemed like a good thing to know. Right? The literature review looked at identity, social influence, affiliation, conflict resolution. It looked at all of those things schemas. It looked at all of those areas of psychology to build an argument that said, we know people, you know, we know, but, you know, theory suggests that people, you know, do this and this and this. Therefore, I'm hypothesizing that people who watch the Olympics, you know, with some kind of commitment are more likely to feel friendly towards China than people who do not. Now, my dissertation, and we talked about this earlier, the difference between causation and correlation, correlation, was done before and after, and it was done with regression analysis. So I was trying to identify predictive variables. If I had just done it before or after, and not both, I could have done a correlation. I could have said, "It's gee, it seems like people who watched a lot of the Olympics feel better about China. But it might be equally true that people who feel better about China watched a lot of the Olympics, right? You, you don't know which way it goes. So it's important to think about what you want to do and how you want to approach a topic um, 
when you do that. And then the methodology is literally the recipe card, you know, to test for conflict, uh, pre 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 propensity to conflict. I'm going to use this assessment tool to test for subjective well-being. I'm going to use this assessment tool. I've devised a survey to, you know, that's an ad adapted from these people to test or uh, to measure attitudes towards China. So it's, and it becomes this sort of little meatloaf. Patchwork quilt? I don't know. There's, there's some analogy there uh, to put it together. But that's literally almost a final document. The difference between the proposal front end and the full dissertation is you have to go back and change the verb tenses, right? In the proposal, you will be. In the dissertation, you did. Study looked at, stuff right. like that. You know, um, yeah, I mean, what, this is a big major stage. And it takes a long time to write this thing. Yeah. And so one recommendation is, and I may have this in another slide, is don't wait to write the whole shebang before you send it to your chair. Send a draft of your of your introduction. You know, say, so does this seem like, you know, send a draft of the literature review, you know, and, and you'll be, you know, we, we talk all the time. And when you, when we've got someone working on dissertation, you know, we probably zoom, well, it depends on the student needs. So I'm like, let, let, let's talk a little bit about drafts or okay, do you, no, go, you go. Because I mean, a draft will, will happen both for some, you know, everything at this point. And I'm just going to, to be honest. If you're in my orbit and you're giving me a draft and I give you feedback and then you give me another and I give you feedback, it's a much easier process. But if you give me a draft and I give you feedback and then you disappear on me for, I don't know, six months or four, you show up. Yeah, whatever, my retention is poor after that. Amount all of a sudden now I've got to go and I have to reacquaint myself with everything. I've got to say, okay, it's almost, it, it, it's just, it is not good. I mean, I think, that it, you get the best feedback when we are continuing with that relationship of whatever draft it is that we are uh, working with. The later drafts, and we'll talk about that, are a little bit different. And that's when I use my split screen method with my students. And I see what you've written here and making sure that, you know. Did you actually change it? Uh, yeah, they do actually, because I have to keep you consistent with your argument, you know, because we're really, you know, we're having the conversations with you. And we're also editors. We're suggesting you're, you know, and so it at that point, it becomes very different. And and um, what we're going to have to also maintain is the integrity of each section of a dissertation and what that means. But once you have this. We could bring all those other things uh, to bear, but this is major because this is at the point where you go IRB and then you're actually gathering your data. This is major. I mean, I think even the registrar will send an email that says, congratulations, you have passed your, you know. Well, and also when your full proposal has been accepted, yes. your tuition drops by 30%. Yes. Now, granted, that makes more difference in clinical where they do internships and all that stuff and they go on and on than it does in media where it's a shorter time horizon. Right. But even if it's one or two terms, yes, that's meaningful. Yes. And at that point, you are ABD. Yes, at that point. Is there a time frame that you estimate for pre-proposal, full proposal, and then also pages on the full proposal? Um, yeah, you, oh, we, you could What's really see like? that... Um, but I'll show you. Yeah, I'll, there's a there's a spreadsheet and it's there's a link. I'll give it to you, and then you can you can plug in when you think you're going to do things and see what sort of how that sort of works out. Um, so these are the 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 steps that the administration cares cares about, <laughs> right? They get on our you know right. So so you know you did your whole thing, you wrote your proposal, everybody signed off, yay, did your final oral review, you're all done, you're not done. <laughs> right? Then the school wants um, a clean copy to send to the proofreader. 
And then the proofreader marks up your dissertation with APA formatting you have never heard of in your <laughs> life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with a little red pencil. And then you correct that, and then you send a clean copy. Now, last I heard, they were still making them send it physically. Are they taking it digitally yet? I the last one I signed, I, it was a digital. digital. They sent me, and I had to scan it back in. Or well, yeah. anyway, and then once you've done all those proofreading things, then you send it to Fielding, and then in their eyes, you're officially done. Done. The clock is still running until they think you're officially done. So don't, you know, get my approval. Hooray, and go on a long vacation because <laughs> you will still be paying tuition. It, it's the same, I, I think, at other schools. I mean, it was the same in mine. I mean, you hated once you got to that office where you know you knew that person was going to look at the APA stuff, no matter how attentive you had been. Right. Well, and it's it, just good to know so you don't have this big adrenaline letdown that you think you're done, and then like, because that I took me totally by surprise. It was like, I have to do what? <laughs> Oh or yeah, no. Three copies of what? Yeah. You know, so um, so just keep that in mind that you need to keep the adrenaline running just a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. Also, sometimes in some cases, uh, an external might approve the final uh, document, uh, but also suggest some touch-ups here and there. Yeah, and that's, right. No, and and that's yeah. not uncommon. Yeah. So. Okay. These are the parts, right? The abstract. The abstract is the story of your dissertation. It has a story arc, right? It is exactly, you know, the problem, you know, why you're doing it, uh, you know, briefly what you did, the results, maybe the conclusion in a sentence or two. Right? It isn't just, in this dissertation, I plan to study the impact of chocolate chip cookies on student <laughs> attention. Now, I get a lot, of, a lot of abstracts explaining to me what something's going to be about, not telling me what it was about. Think of the dissertation. It's really, you're really just telling a story in weird language. And the abstract is also what other people read once you're published to figure out if they want to read the whole friggin' thing. Right. So if you don't tell them what's in it and what's of value to them, which is to say what you found, the chances of them reading it and then citing it, if that's going to be important to you, it, which is it, it will be if you're in an academic path, not if you're in other paths. Um, the chances of you citing are much greater if you make the abstract sound like something people would want to read and sound something useful to them. I described the introduction and statement of problem when I was talking about mine. That's not the only way to do it, but basically that's the broad strokes of what you're doing and why, but not exactly what you're doing. It's sort of like you're examining this because there's this problem. This is the so what. This is the research question. The results, because we talked about the literature review, we talked about the methodology. The results are just that. They are the results. You don't wax on philosophically when you're reporting your results. You report the results. The results. The, the numbers, numbers, the tables, the charts, the whatever. Now, the more intelligible you can make it, the like more you know, the easier it is on the reader, right? So they can figure out what it is you actually did and found. But that's where you report, you know, things like the p-values and all of that stuff that you know don't exactly make great uh, cocktail party discussion, but they have to go somewhere. The discussion is where you get to talk about what you found in relation to your goal. You address your hypotheses in the results. You know, I this confirmed the hypotheses, this didn't confirm the hypotheses. Or if it's qualitative and you don't have a hypothesis, then you're that's where you have the total breakdown of all of the data and the content tagging or the grounded theory or whatever you're doing. The discussion is where you summarize the results in the context of the theory. 
and talk about what you found and how that did or didn't fit with what you were. And 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 you could even if, if say you know uh, you know this didn't work. On the other hand, research by so does a you know says that perhaps addressed from this perspective it would you know I mean this is where um, you can really reflect on what has happened. You can even contextualize. Um, you know, I, I, I find that a lot of students have a lot of contextualization at the beginning uh, when they start writing. And I usually highlight and say, cut this out now, put it in a folder. It might be useful for discussion. Right. But not at the beginning. Right. Um, but it really is um, a discussion where you have a little more latitude uh, in addressing your results. Yes, but you do not have so much latitude that you can turn a correlation into a call. Oh, that would never work. <laughs> no, the, 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 yeah, no. Now you no. and you all laugh, but I can't tell you how. You know, I would say five out of ten dissertations come through, and if that that correlation is just kind of corrupt over there, <laughs> to have bigger implications than it than it has. Yeah. Because people get so passionate about things, they want to show that there's an impact in a direction when in fact there's just a relationship. Now, a relationship is super important. But let me just say this. Let's say you go to all of this work and there is no relationship. That's okay too. You do not have to have huge findings or any significant findings to have it be a valid study. Because you have to know what isn't as well as you have to know what is. So don't, you know, don't be dis despair. Don't massage your numbers so that you get something. Don't cherry pick. Write up what you have and be proud of the effort. I know, you know, I mean, there's, it's terrible because there's a, there's a tremendous bias in academic journals um, publishing things with, you know, significant impact of what, about half of which in the last few years have been shown to be bogus. Uh, but and partly those things get manipulated because of the pressure to publish and the bias in of publications against find uh, findings, you know, against not finding something, right? But we have no bias of that here. We want just a good solid study. If you don't find anything, we have no problem with that. You know who uh, was Carlos, who did the who did a study on whether or not the pop up messages changed which hotel rooms people oh yes, yes 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 we were and he that. did a very nice study um with you know different scenarios and and he he found no no difference between one kind of message and another but that's okay i mean that's valuable information if you're a marketer that's valuable information it, it, even um if it doesn't pan out uh, you're learning from it. And then in, in the discussion, you can talk about perhaps why it didn't pan out. Right. Right. You start saying, well, maybe if you do this or if you do that, or was it a limitation of how you set up your study, your study, for example, the question, uh, your methodology, all of those things. So even if you get that kind of result, I mean, there's still a lot to, um, discuss. By the way, while we're on here, when, when my students start working with me, I always recommend surviving your dissertation. And it was written by um, two fielding faculty. It's a very popular book I have found. It's also in the library. Yeah, it's also in the library. So I just say to the students, download chapter one. And the reason why I do that is because I find that it is a very, it goes through what each, each of these areas uh, contain how you should write it, how you should, because now it gives me and my student something that we can address. A common, yeah, a common thing. And so when you're asking me, well, what did, what did you read? And I'm, okay, I'll say read and then come back and report. Tell me what's in there. What, what did they say? What, right. We have that conversation and it's something <laughs> tangible. It talks about how to set up questions with qualitative methods, does a review of qualitative methods, and different methodologies. So I, and it's in our library, so you're not going to have to by it. I actually know friends who, when they were doing their dissertation, unbeknownst to me, because I wasn't at fielding yet, uh, they were actually using an earlier edition right. of this. Uh, and I was going to say, I have a much earlier edition. You have a, yeah, but it's really uh, 
a great it's really book. helpful. It's, it's really, really helpful. helpful. I mean, even you, I mean, outside field, it's a bestseller. Imagine. Yeah, bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Surviving your dissertation. Well, you know how many people want to survive a dissertation? Well, yes. <laughs> how many people have dissertations, though? That's that's yeah. a lower number. Yeah. Um, a lot At the end of the discussions comes limitations, and then often you will also put opportunities for future research. Yes. So don't, you know, don't grouse about all the things that went wrong in your study all through your discussion. Save all of those for the limitations section because something will always go wrong. Um, yeah, the Russians invaded Georgia in the middle of the Beijing Olympics, which was... <laughs> <laughs> might have had it. Might have had an impact. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. It's like, what the hell, you guys? Stay home. <laughs> Not during my study. I know, right? Thank you. And then the after the references comes all the stuff. Right. The appendices, right? The appendices have copies of every assessment tool that you use, every survey all of that stuff so that people can look. It has, if you need to get permissions, for example, I used um, a, a survey on subjective well-being by people whose name I cannot remember at this moment, but I should know, and um, Carver and somebody. Anyway, so I emailed for permission, they emailed me back permission, that email goes in there. Uh, your completed IRB, you know, approval, the IRB certificate that you took the little IRB test so that you are an ethical researcher, that goes in there. The letter from your mother, no. Um, <laughs> but, you know, sort of all the housekeeping goes, goes at the end. And then, actually, this is incorrect because the chair reader methodologist and the external examiner yes. all have to sign off. Yep. And the approval goes out electronically through the administration. You get feedback by email from, from everybody on the committee, but the um, but the dime doesn't drop until those That's electronic another, forms yeah. get sent back in. And sometimes there's a lag, and I, I find myself as chair saying, please fill this out if right. you haven't. And, you know, that's you one know? of the greatest things about the media psychology program at Fielding is that the faculty gets along very well yeah. together. Yeah. You know, there's some... Schools where, you know, that guy doesn't like that guy, and so they oh, work yeah. really hard to sabotage each other's students, and they do all that kind of oh, thing. Yeah. It's yeah. super easy here. If I've got a student and we're not getting a response from Regina, I just email Regina and say, you probably didn't realize, but we're on the clock here, you know, or it's been three weeks, and she's like, oh, I didn't, you know, and you know, because we've got these huge piles of these things, and you're like, oh. um, so yeah. we work really well together, and so sometimes you'll, I might make a suggestion about who to have on a committee, and partly that's based on how many dissertations I know they currently have on their desk, right, or how responsive they're going to be able to be. So it's that sense, even though there's that lag, we work very well together, and, and so we really, we never have any of those kind of what call traditional school conflicts that you might run into in other places. May I ask, sometimes yeah. I've seen a statement about conflict of interest. Or not. Oh, you mean in re research, public, published research, mm -hmm. like in journals? It's, so that's not in the dissertation. Because I'm always curious, Well, if you had a conflict, why would you even bother? No, <laughs> no. Um, we, first of all, we would know. I mean, we would, Well, yeah, so the conflict of interest, I don't know that that would come up in, in a, a dissertation. dissertation. That's a conflict of journals. interest might come up if you were doing a study on Mattel toys and it turned out son of a gun you were sponsored by Mattel to do research you know so there's those kind of conflicts of interest um, that's one of the reasons why the external can't be somebody that you know you know can't be your aunt or uncle just you know like, you know it has to be someone who uh, it could be someone that you met that would be okay um, my preferred way of finding an external is find an article that you think is pretty pivotal to and what, approach them. To what, yeah, mm -hmm. what you're doing in your research and email it. You know, and and those are cold, and you'll be surprised how often they say yes. Can an external be a formal No. No. How can they give you unbiased feedback? You know, but there's a lot of opportunities. Um, Patrick McNabb is doing a, a dissertation on on um, trans education, entertainment, and transmedia. 
So the guy emails the top name in the education entertainment literature, unbeknownst to me, because I probably would have stopped him. <laughs> yeah, that goes on too. And, it, and he said yes. So Arvin Single is her his external examiner. Now, Patrick's having to do a lot of drafts on his dissertation <laughs> because I am not sending a dissertation to Arvin Single out and if it isn't pretty darn good. And, and that's it's a lot of those. Yeah, well, yes. He wrote with Miguel Sabado. Yes, and he well, yes, he wrote Miguel Sabado and wished him happy birthday and copied his external examiner, at which point I had to tell him, do not correspond with your external examiner anymore. But, you know, you get so enthusiastic about it, and these people are so nice, and they're so excited that you want to do their work that, um, you know, that they're happy to help. And so, I mean, in this, and that, so that was such a generous overture and he's so excited. Now he's really fired up to do a good job. So it's, I mean, he was anyway, but, um, but so don't feel like you have, don't feel stressed about that. Just, you know, you just start going through the literature once you get a little bit closer, once you're in your pre-proposal and, and you'll find some people that are worth sending an email to, you know, they might, some might not say yes, some might not respond, but our experience is more say yes than no. Do um, you guys want to take a break before we talk about timing and planning? Or do you want to talk about timing and then take a break and we'll come back and do questions? I, I see yawning, so. It's, it's about timing, so it's your call. <laughs> break now? Yeah. yeah, break now. Yeah, sure. And what yeah. timing is the cookies are there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's, it's, let's come back in 15 minutes. All right.